Hi everybody and welcome to this documentary on Timeline. My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. John, put your back into it. Don't fall down the cliff, will you? As usual, the first job of the day is to get John and his team on the case with their geophysical wizardry. I can't see any obvious pitfalls on the site, so they've no excuse not to deliver. Hey up, John, this must be the perfect site for you. <laughs> it's an absolute nightmare. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's wide open, there's nobody about, there's no power lines, no trees. Fantastic. Wide open, it's about the size of a sixpence. It's really not an easy sight. I mean, there's hardly any soil on the ground. I mean, look, we're straight onto bedrock. Come on, it's a lovely day. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. The village of Bednall is situated on the northeast coast of Britain, just a few miles south of Bamborough Castle and the monastery island of Lindisfarne. Our site, Ebbs Nook, is a small promontory on the edge of the village. It's a location steeped in history. The question is, where best to start? Looks like someone's done a survey or something of it already. Yeah, it was dug in the middle of the 19th century, about 150 years ago, and they thought it was associated with St Ab, who was a local 7th century saint. I mean, the chapel itself is, is thought to be 13th century, but what we don't know is whether or not there's any evidence of anything that is going way, way back before that time. Yeah. Also, people have been picking loose bone up along the pathway on the north side of the chapel. We need a, a section, a, a trench, that takes in the burials and the chapel. And then there's this mysterious conker-looking thing here. It is at the east end of the chapel, and, and there is a, a strong suspicion that it might be earlier. That's the crucial thing. When does the story really begin? We need to find out when the first structure was built on Ebb's Nook and discover why human bones keep rising to the surface. Could this be an early Christian site going back to the 7th century and the time of St Ebb herself? This isn't the first time in recent history that Ebb's Nook has gone under the spade. During the Second World War, it was covered in coastal defence trenches. Away from the dig, I want to find out what the two newest members of our team have in their sights. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at what the Second World War damage will have done to the site before yeah. I look at the, the wider landscape as well. Ash that. And then three metres off of that. I'm really excited about this one. I really want to get stuck into the early medieval Dark Age history and find out who St Ebert is. The thing I'm most intrigued about, I think, is this mysterious lump could it be something that's much older, or is it just Second World War? Up on the headland, the team are preparing to open the trench over the chapel. It'll stretch from one side of the promontory to the other. God damn wind! Have we got a book going on how many times Phil's hat flies off in this wind? We should put a piece of string round it, round it so it holds it on his ears, you know. <laughs> Hang on, Phil! Oh. The Reverend Jane Wood is the local parish vicar, and her church is named after, you've guessed it, St Ebb. Mary Ann's keen to get some background information on the site. Jane, oh, so hi. good to meet you. Hello, good to hi. meet you. How are you? How does this site, the parish church, relate to the chapel on the coast? Once a year on the 25th of August, which is St Ebb's festival, uh, the community all go down to the point to the old chapel. We start off with a picnic, and that, that's all shared, and then we have, a, we have a service, and it's quite a festival. Jane, what is it that you want us to find in the next three days? Well, one thing, we've found these bones 
have been coming to the surface and various people have found them, mm. uh, which suggests there's a graveyard down there. And if there is, I'd like to know where it ends, how big it is, because obviously people are walking over there and that's not a good idea. No. I've heard of tenacious grass. This stuff is just plain stubborn. We want to find out how old this chapel is, which means getting good dating evidence. But as it isn't a domestic site, we're unlikely to find pottery. So we're looking for architectural features, burials, anything that could give us that all-important information. Yeah, that's looking really good. Have you found anything interesting from it yet? Oh, yeah, fascinating. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? <laughs> uh, I bagged it up so Wessex can wash it. But, um, I love you. you know, I'm thinking, you know, maybe circa 87 or something like that. You know, you never know. While the rest of the team battle the wind, Alex, Mary Ann and Dr Sam Newton have found sanctuary in a nearby B&B. They're scouring the local maps and documents, hoping to find clues as to the age of our site. Unfortunately, the earliest reference I can find to a chapel on that site is from this map, which is 1707, and it's not particularly clear. Can you just make that out, that splash of red there? Oh, uh, yeah, with a little cross next to it. Yeah, exactly. So that's giving us our earliest reference um, to a, a chapel, uh, a religious focus on that site. Is that the first building that would have been on that site? It needn't have been a building to start with. It might have been a sort of outdoor, uh, like a cross, a standing cross. The very fact we've got a dedication to a rare 7th century abbess, formidable in her own right, on this place, alone suggests we've got something early. But again, we have to wait and see what archaeology can or, or cannot prove. So the documents weren't much help. The place name, Ebb's Nook, with its reference to St Ebb, could easily point to an early structure on the site, maybe a standing cross. Mick's doing a really important job, pondering. When I first saw this, you see this square thing here, or this lump here? Yeah. You remember the site we did at Mull on the western coast of Scotland? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never know where we've been, do you? But there was a chapel, and out the east end was this thing called a lochter, which was like an outdoor shrine with a cross on it. Yeah. Right? And now, this is in the same position. It might be something to do with that. But this could all be Second World War. So it could be, say, from when the Vikings were over here, but it could be from when the Yanks were over here. Uh, indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll dig a hole and find out. Mary Ann and the Reverend Jane are hot on the trail of the eponymous St Ebb. Sam, who was St Ebb? Uh, before I answer that question, I must pedantically point out uh, <laughs> the correct pronunciation should be St Ab. But we'll stick to Ebb because it's what we call around here, so fair enough. And her name, therefore, is Old English, and it fits with the names of her illustrious brothers, St Oswald himself, a king, a martyr, a very powerful man in his own right, and his almost as powerful brother, Oswy. All of them the children of the formidable uh, old king Athelfrith of Northumbria, who really put Northumbria on the map in a, in a very big way. St Abbs descended from the old gods, just like her brothers, and so she's right. got an intrinsic uh, sanctity in uh, her blood. So, Sam, what was the role of women in the church at this time? In the 7th century, women clearly are playing a very big part in the church. St Abb is one of a series of what I would call formidable abbesses we see across uh, the country at this time, part of the... the the newly establishing religious allegiance of Christianity. Back on site, things don't seem to be going according to plan. At least not the plan I saw. You two guys, you're always the same. You say you're going to do one thing, you do something entirely different. I was expecting a trench that started there, went all the way way over there. What have we got, this little stumpy thing? Yeah, well, while you've been having a kip and drinking a bottle of champagne or whatever else you've been doing while we've been out here, we've had a revised strategy. Yes, but we have done exactly what we said we were going to do. No, you haven't. You were going to put in a trench down there that went all the way over there. We haven't dug it there, health and safety. So what we've done is we've moved it and we've dug it over there where it's safe to dig it. So you've got the separate bit of this trench which you've magicked yeah. Over to here. 
Yeah, you health should and be safety. impressed with that. Health and safety, you, you cannot... You keep saying health and safety, health and safety, You, you cannot mean? dig this close to the edge of the cliff. Oh, I see, so you're putting it in so here. So you put it in yeah. there. Yeah. The rest of the trench is exactly as we said it was, going straight the way across the headland. That's a very silly hat. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see defeat again. <laughs> Well, the archaeologists seem to know what they're doing with the chapel, but that's not the only reason we're here. For years, people have been finding human bones on this promontory, and sure enough, Jackie's spotted something lying just beneath the surface of the footpath. Well, Jackie, what you got there? Well, it looks awfully like we've got a bit of somebody's arm. So you've got the two bones, the forearm, then when we get down the bottom here, you can just start to see those little bones of the wrists coming through there. So it looks like we've got our first in situ burial right in the middle of the footpath. You couldn't get more in the middle of the footpath, <laughs> could you? Are we going to have to close it off? I think we have, yes. That's going to be really useful. Excavating human remains is a painstakingly slow process, so the path will need to be closed off for the remainder of the dig. It's nearly the end of our first day here in Ebb's Nook, and while I've been tracking the progress of the trenches, Mary Ann's been out and about researching the history of the site. How you got on? Okay, the documents aren't that helpful. There aren't many references to St Ebbs. So a bit scant, really. Mm. But Sam thinks that the place name is key. Well, the archaeology is pretty tantalising too. There's this feature at the East End, my conquer, which we haven't even started looking at. Well, that might tie into this idea that Sam had that if it is an early Christian site, there might have been a freestanding cross right at the end of the promontory. So, do we have a very early Christian site, or is it a Second World War gun emplacement? We'll find out tomorrow. Beginning of day two here at beautiful Beadnell in Northumbria, where we're looking for evidence of a very early chapel dedicated to St. Ebe, a local 7th century saint. And as you can see, it looks as though we've already got the later medieval chapel wall. And behind me, there's lots of mysterious lumps and bumps which appear to be much earlier, so we're certainly going to excavate those. And over here, there's the extension of this trench. We've kept the grass on top to prevent erosion. But the big story so far has got to be Jackie and the bones that she's found, including what seems to be almost an entire skeleton right in the middle of the path. What can we tell about it now, Jackie? Well, almost entire skeleton is correct, because we've got the legs down here, so we've got the femur here, kneecap and the, and the lower part of the leg, and then across here we've got the forearm and the hand bones. But as you get up this end here, unfortunately, we've lost the bone from that end, the skull has gone. Basically, it's been eroded by people's feet as they're walking along, because it's so very, very shallow. At least it's shallow now, yeah. obviously, it would have been deeper in the past. How do we know that? Well, if you look to the land to either side, you can see it's much higher. Oh, I see, so actually, the original height would have been like that. Yeah. So there's all that difference in height. Yes, and you can see here, even where I was taking the turf off, the turf is lifting the bone yeah. up with it. Yeah. We've informed the authorities that a skeleton has been uncovered on site and the local coppers have turned up to investigate. Hello? Hello. Hello. Well, here we are, as you can see, right in the middle of the path. Um, there's parts of an adult left over there. You can see that's the arm. Yep. That's the arm there and the legs there. The implications all are that we're dealing with a medieval okay. burial. Just bring you down out the way and just get a couple of lines off you to that effect. Is that sure. all right? Yeah, little statement. Uh huh. Thank okay. <laughs> While Jack is assisting the police with their inquiries, Phil's working on getting down to the original floor of the chapel. But it's a bigger job than he'd expected. What have you found? Well, I mean, apart from just beginning to get the layout of this building, which is impressive, we're actually getting some, some fines. But, you see, we've got, within the same layer, white china and medieval pot. So what, is that white china, 18th, 19th yeah, century? and that's, you know, yeah. that, that's probably, I don't know, 14th, 15th, 16th century, something like that. Still no idea how much deeper you're going to need to go? No, I mean, we just have to keep digging until we get to the bottom. 
We must reach the original floor to give us a chance of finding evidence that could date the chapel. Over in the pathway trench, Jackie is meticulously excavating her skeleton. Outside the south door of the chapel, Ian and Matt have yet to hit archaeology. So far, we've not been able to answer any of the questions we set out to resolve. Could John's geophysical results be about to give us the break we really need? Well, I hope you've not been holding your breath. I mean, it's all very confused where we've collected the data. I, I mean, I don't really know what we've got. I, I think my main worry is we know there were World War II trenches cutting mm. across here. Oh, right. And these trenches will explain the confused geophysical results. Right. I mean, the worry is, have they disturbed the archaeology below? Well, we shall find that out, actually, because that bit there is actually going through where the doorways are into the chapel. That's the south door, then, the to south the chapel, door, right? Then. And it looks as though it misses that point of interest at the end of the chapel. And our results suggest that probably isn't modern. Oh, that's a relief, actually, because we, we are going to dig that, so that if the trench has missed it and it's not modern, it's still worth us looking at in relation to the chapel. So the geophysics didn't give us exactly what we were hoping for, but we did get some valuable information about the mysterious mound that I've been calling the Conquer. Now we know it's not a recent addition and wasn't affected by the World War II trenching, it shot to the top of our to-do list. Result. After seeing the disruption that showed up on John's geophysics survey, Alex is seriously concerned that the archaeology in the south doorway trench could be badly damaged. How's it going, Matt? Uh, not bad, actually, Alex. Look, we've uh, had to clean down to what I think I'd like to think of as the, uh, the, the first kind of undisturbed bit of archaeology. You say yeah. undisturbed? Yeah. Well, that's great news to me, because this is the area where we were most worried about that Second World War damage. Coming through the south wall of the chapel here, um, and this is, of course, where you're digging. So it looks like the Second World War trench would have come across something like that. The only damage that we do have, actually, is from the 19th century antiquarians who appear to have found the burial over there, right. had a good look at it, a couple of bits of bone left over, so yeah. uh, Second World War didn't really touch <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> 19th century antiquarian, though, right. did a bit of damage, yeah. OK, well, I'll pop back later this afternoon to see you get on. While Alex concentrates on the more recent history of the site, Marianne wants to go back in time to the 7th century, when St Ebb was alive. She's keen to find out how our site might fit into that early Christian coastline. Sam and Mick figure that an interactive lesson is probably the best solution. Personally, I think it's just an excuse to relive their childhoods. That is Bamborough Castle. Right, so we've now got all the early Anglo-Saxon royal centres. We've got Edinburgh that way. We've got Bamborough near us. We've got Lindisfarne and then all the monasteries that get established in the 7th and 8th centuries along the coast. The Red Bucket represents Bedenal, where our site's located. We want to know if we can add it to this pattern of early Christian sites. You know, this is all established, say, from 650 right through to about 800. There's a golden age yes. in Northumbria. Not only all these monasteries, but they're full of people producing these great manuscripts with illuminations and colour and so on. They've no reason to think that anything's going to happen, they're going to carry on as Northumbria for forever. And then something happens in... Yes, 793. Out of the blue, across the horizon, comes the attack of the Vikings. You mean literally out of the blue because it's the Vikings coming over the sea? Across the horizon. You see, the problem is the monks on there think that God is looking after them and nobody can walk in and nick all the, mm. the treasure and kill everybody. They think, a, you know, a bolt from heaven will come down yeah. And, and kill the perpetrators, but it doesn't happen. And these lot who are coming over the sea realise that there are these places full of treasure that are unfortified. So you can damage all those coastal monasteries as the Vikings raid them. Monk Wearmouth, Jarrow, What Whitby. happens to the monks? Well, the monks leave Lindisfarne and they eventually end up at Durham, which is a fortified peninsula in the Weir Valley. And is that it? No, that's still not <laughs> it, because in the 12th century, people from Durham, seeing all these ruined and wrecked 
monasteries from a couple of hundred years before decide that they've really got to re-establish them. They rebuild Lindisfarne, they rebuild Jarrow, and that could well be when our place at Beadnell is established as part of that process. Or re-established. Or re-established, yes. Oh. You tell me I have to build all these castles again? You've then <laughs> got to repair them, because they all get repaired in the 12th century. So Beadnell could have been an early Christian site, abandoned during the Viking raids and rebuilt in the 12th century. Or it could simply have been established when the monks returned from Durham to reclaim the coastline. We really need to find something we can date. It's halfway through day two and things are beginning to hot up. At the far side of the chapel, we've discovered a skull. And over by the south doorway, Matt's finally reached something useful. Uh, and there's two uh, interesting things going on in this trench. This end of the trench, we've got a wall coming along there. And it seems to turn a corner and go off in that direction beyond the end of the trench. Uh, and that's pretty unexpected. It's on a completely different alignment to the chapel. It doesn't seem to join up with it. It could be an earlier structure. What's slightly more expected is down here. Can you see these stones? Um, we've had a few bones come out of it, some adult foot bones there. And uh, we've got a child or baby's leg bone as well, so two individuals. Is this what they call a kist, a sort of stone-lined burial? Yes, you can see it coming across there, along there, be going out this direction beyond the trench. What are you going to do with it now? Well, I think we might uh, just keep on going inside here, see if we can find any more bones, and then possibly extend either way, I think. The mystery wall. Yeah. So that mystery wall means there could be a second building on the site, which is great, but we still haven't got any datable evidence, and we're running out of time. While the team are breaking their backs on the headland, mary -Ann's discovering why there were so many early Christian monks in the area. Is there something about this coast that drew them here particularly? Yes, there's a real pattern here in this northern landscape under these northern skies. There's a sense that the coast is at the edge of the world. We're right out on the edge of the known world. They're turning their backs on everyday life and they are contemplating the infinite in these remote spots. These are the northern equivalents to the desert fathers wrestling with their demons. In our quest for knowledge about the site, we're leaving no stone unturned. Alex has just been volunteered for the risky job of abseiling down the cliff face. We're keen to find out what he can discover from the layers of deposits crumbling into the sea. What can you see there? Well, we've definitely got archaeological deposits here. Yeah. And if I actually just lean up to there, OK, that is a mussel shell. Now, what's it doing all the way on top of our promontory here? How did it get here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's someone obviously living up here and, and, and eating seafood. So could it have been some kind of dump around here, do you think? We know we've got the same sorts of deposits eroding out of Lindisfarne, Holy Island, just further up the coast. Um, so it's just as likely that if we've got human occupation here that they're going to obviously be throwing their waste out. And this is what we're seeing being exposed here by the weather. Right, well, let's see who's in the lunch queue first, shall we? <laughs> Certainly not going to be me, is it? <laughs> Guys? Middle of day two here at Ebbs Nook in Northumbria, and we've got skeletons coming up all over the place. We've got really interesting walls and absolutely no dating evidence no, whatsoever. No, that's right. Not so far, no, but we always knew that was going to be a difficult thing to do. So what are we going to do? Well, we've had permission to take some of the stone wall away. So where's the bit we're going to remove? Well, you see, we have Phil's green boxes yeah. there. It's the stones just beyond that. We're going to be able to take them down and go straight down. And hopefully we might find some kind of architectural feature in yeah. a particular style That's that right. we can at least date. Don't hold your breath, though. <laughs> During the 7th and 8th centuries, this coastline was a hive of activity. Only 20 miles down the road on the island of Lindisfarne, the local monks created a priceless and unique work of art. One of Britain's greatest treasures, the Lindisfarne Gospels. Susan Moore is a professional calligrapher, an expert in using the original materials and techniques of the period. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> the pages are made from calfskin vellum, 
So the calf skin is treated with lime, they take off the skin and the hair, and then it's scraped and sanded until it's a really nice surface to write on, really better than paper, actually. Did they have to make their own paint as well? They did. They couldn't just buy the paint, so we had to go right back to the natural materials and some pretty weird and wonderful stuff there. I think the purple is made from lichen mixed with stale urine. I'm going to have a go right. at recreating one of these pages. What, the, what with your page like that? <laughs> well, I think I might start off with something a little more yeah. modest. OK. But, Alex, I'm going to send you on a bit of a shopping trip. Our goal was to find out when the first structure was built on Ebb's Nook, and the Reverend Jane wants to know the extent of the burials. To answer those questions, we've dug three trenches. The pathway trench, the south doorway trench, and the chapel trench. But as yet, none have produced the evidence we need. It's time to dig one more. This is the moment I've been waiting for. That's the chapel there, right? So it's here on this drawing. And over here is a thing which I called the conquer, because it's got little spikes coming out of it. It actually looks more like a space invader, but people are still all calling it the conquer now. And that's here, excuse me, lads. And you reckon, Mick, it could be quite early, don't you? It could be, yeah. I mean, it's little sort of structure like this off the east end of a chapel like this. You know, you're thinking, perhaps base for a cross or place for a shrine or something like that. On know. the other hand, it could be Second World War. Well, I don't think it can because John's looked at the geophysics now and he can see the concrete bases of structures up here and this isn't one of them. So if there ever was a little mound of stones with a cross on the top, then this would be the perfect place for it. That's what we're hoping. Keep your fingers crossed. Hello? Down in Trench 1, Phil has collared a willing pair of ears. For the Reverend Jane, it's a unique opportunity to see layers of history peeled back from a place that's always been close to her heart. What do you think, then? It's amazing. It really is amazing. It's just to think that for seven years I've been holding a service at that level here on St Ebb's Day, and um, here we are in it. You know they dug it out in the 19th century. I've been told that, yeah. OK. Now, their interpretation of it was that where we're standing now would be at the east end of the nave. So, they're suggesting that you'd go through there and the high altar is in front of us. Mm. That's where you go, that's not where I go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if this was the nave and the chancel, you'd expect that it's all going to be built in one go. You look here, you've got a straight joint going all the way down there. If it was all in one phase, they, they would be, it'd it be all knitted in yeah. together. And so right. what it looks like is that perhaps we've got two phases. That is later than this. That's good. Right. Because what it would mean is that the original chapel was literally a rectangle, very similar to what you'd expect in the early Christian uh, chapels. Really? It seems likely that our building was constructed in two stages. The original was similar in shape to early Christian chapels, while the extended version was more like a type of structure built in the 12th century. The intrepid Alex has managed to track down the last items on Mary Ann's bizarre shopping list. Alex, what have you got me? Some seaweed here with lichen on. Good luck making pigments out of this okay. stuff. Um, swan's feathers as well. Ah, just the job. They said it couldn't be done. Um, <laughs> some eggs, some charcoal. Good. Copper. And copper, yeah. Some copper as well. I've got my work cut out. See you later. Good luck. Cassie, this trench is in our mystery lump, isn't it? It is. Have you found anything yet? But as soon as we've taken the turf off, um, we're pretty much immediately down on lots and lots of human bone. And what we're finding is we've got um, neonate, or actually probably um, slightly early babies buried. Neonate being? Newborn. Um, you know, very, very tiny babies. I mean, this you one is... You say babies in the plural? Tiny. Yeah, we've got... Well, where are they? Um, one just over there. Um, it's quite hard to see in the dust. There's some, just some ribs and skull at the top. Yeah. And he's sort of curled round to the left, so he's got his arms up and his legs up. And the same with this one, is the skull just here. A little eye socket, if you can see how tiny that is. Yeah. And then um, there's a humerus and the arms just down there, back round there, and again, legs sort of facing this way. Have you any idea why 
so many newborn babies might be in the same place? Well, the, the idea is that as, as um, a complex like this falls out of use and, and you, sort of the centre moves to whatever your new local church is, that it continues, the site continues to be used for the burial of you know, very tiny infants, that people who aren't baptised, if you like, people that haven't quite made full status to end up in a churchyard. So, so, so they're a little bit of a problem yeah. and you take them to as near as you can get to a holy yeah. place. And it seems to be that you, you take all the babies to the same place. How do you find doing this kind of excavation? I should find it quite tricky. I think out of the people on site, I'm the soppiest when it comes to digging up time. <laughs> well, you've got anyone. little kids, haven't you? I have, and it's when you see their fingers and it's just like your little baby's fingers and then they never really got a go. That's the trouble. When we came to Ebb's Nook, we didn't expect to find a cluster of baby burials outside the east end of the chapel. It's a poignant insight into the way the site has been used through the centuries. But it's also difficult for us, as each burial would take time to excavate. In the chapel trench, the central wall has been dismantled in the hope of finding some datable architecture, but it's a long shot. It looks like the only way we're going to be able to find out when this chapel was built is to find bone that we can radiocarbon date. Mary Ann's learning how to create the pigments that the seventh century monks would have used to produce the original Lindisfarne Gospels. Red particularly looks nice, makes it brighter and richer if we add an egg yolk to it. A regular chicken's egg? A regular chicken's egg. Come on, Delia. <laughs> oh. That's, a, that's great. Oh. Yeah. There we go. And then we only need to add a little bit to this. Oops, I've got too much. And I can mix that up. That's a gorgeous ready orange colour. What colour does the lichen make? That makes a purple, but it's not just the lichen. You need to, to treat it. So it actually needs some urine on there. <laughs> OK. Um, I know who I'm going to ask for that. Mm. Do the outline well, down the pub tonight. No prizes for guessing who will be asked to provide a specimen. We've come to the end of day two, and it's time to face up to some hard decisions. When we came here, we set out to go as far back in time as we could yeah, on that yeah. side. Maybe even the Just time of St. Yeah. Now, we've done fantastically well today, certainly yeah. in terms of skeletons, but the fact is that they're preventing us doing what we came here to do in the first place. I suppose that our problem is where can we get deepest into the site to get what might be the earliest material? Yeah, because if we dig up all those skeletons, it'll take forever. It'll take forever, it'll, it'll sort us off. So, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't pick certain of these trenches which will get us back to the deepest, the early stuff. Now we've established that there are our burials all over the place. Like you say, I think we should select yeah. separate ones for further examination. You're going to say different trenches, aren't you? Well, I, I knew you would. Where we should be digging yeah. is the ones where we can get enough radiocarbon samples to get firm yeah. dates yeah. to, to compare yeah. back yeah. to the chapel. Oh, we've got to do trench five. We've got to do nothing of the sort. Yeah. Look, 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 there's no Knowing chance. these two, this is one of those debates that's going to go on until closing time. But um, while they agree about that one, Finishing their argument up, there is one tiny thing I said I would do for Mary Ann this evening. Can I have a bit of privacy, please? Beginning of day three here in Ebb's Nook in Northumbria, and we've got a major problem. As you can see, there's a skeleton there, slap bang in the middle of the path without a head. Over here in this trench, we've got a jumble of bones plus a skeleton with its head. In this trench here, we've got the skeletons of three little babies. Four. Four little babies. Thank you, Cassie. As you see, things are changing all the time. In this trench, there's a jumble of bones. 
down here we've got a stone burial box and another jumble of bones. And the problem is all these bones, understandably, take a long time to deal with, which means we can't get down to the archaeology and answer the questions we came here to answer, which are how old is this site and can we link it to its patron saint, St Ebb? And the debate has been going on long and hard all through the evening. As you can see, there's a, a few bleary eyes here today, in particular this pair of bleary eyes. I'm not good in the morning, you know that. I know, but what are we going to do about these trenches? We can't dig everything, can we? No, well, we certainly can't deal with all the burials in every trench. And, and I think we're agreed we don't need any more trenches. We've got, we've got a lot of work on. But and you disagree about which trenches to leave and which trenches to dig. The difficulty is deciding which ones will give us the earlier material or the earlier burials that we can get data from. You're gambling on well, getting yeah. down to find yeah. skeletons which we might not we actually might not. get. You do realise that between the two of you, you've argued for every single trench, mm. except Trench 5, the one with the little babies in it, which is the one that I want to excavate. Don't laugh at me, Joe <laughs> Grundy. The reason is because Mick says that that could be where the earliest yeah. part of the site yeah. actually is. You yeah. might have to swallow your pride and, and actually accept that because of the babies in there, we cannot resolve that trench. They are so irritating. Without something to date, we're unable to prove the age of the chapel. As this is a religious site, we're unlikely to find much pottery. So our only option is to look for a burial, either under or next to one of the walls. Marianne is ready to start work on her Lindisfarne Gospel page. She's using similar materials and tools to those the monks worked with over a thousand years ago. But she's only got one day to create her work of art. Sue, so this is really hard. It is very detailed work, absolutely minute. Is it likely that they would have worked outside? I think it's quite possible. After all, the windows are very small, and if you've got a nice sheltered area, the light's brilliant when you're working outside. We've got an extra piece of equipment on the promontory, and within minutes, it pays dividends. This has just come from the spoil that Alan's detecting on at the moment. It's a medieval silver coin. So you can see, uh, just about make out the portrait of uh, the king. What I can make out is um, the words Rex Ang. King of England, by king the sound of, of it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And I've managed to date it so far between 1277 and 1379. What do you think then, Jackie? Well, I think what you thought was just a skull is actually yeah. <laughs> part of an articulated in situ individual here. You've got the neck vertebra coming down here. And then across here, we've got the shoulder. Mm. So I think we've got an undisturbed burial. This is the kind of staining you get from, from shroud pins. Now, the problem with shroud pins is that they have a very long life, so it's not very handy for dating. Mm. But there have been none found before the 12th century. So another great find, but still nothing to link our site to the 7th or 8th century. And we're running out of time. Can I try with the magnifying glass? Yes, of course, see if that helps. It's such fine work. Oh, that is better. Good. No reading glasses back no. then. No. People argue about whether they might have had some kind of magnifiers, but there's no evidence for it. Since we've been digging this site, we've found plenty of skeletons, but none close enough to the chapel to allow us to date it. What we really need is a burial that's adjacent to or inside one of the exterior walls. In the southern doorway trench, the burials seem a bit like buses. You wait for ages, then three turn up at once. So what have you got, then? I've got this chap here. And that's his skull, and his face is facing up that way, and that's the top of his humerus, so he's running that way. I've got the arm bones and the hand of another burial running through here like that, and then down here, I've got the pair of feet. What those bones are telling us, well, we've actually got now a skeleton which is going underneath the stone kist. That is very, very good, and we're beginning to get some idea of stratification. The lowest burial is of most interest. If it's still in its original resting place, it should give us a clue to when this site first came into use. 
If we can get some more bone from that pair of feet down there, we could get a radiocarbon date from this side of the chapel. It would be great. Oh, yeah. Roll on some abs. So what have you got here then, Emma? This is the 1940s. The topographical survey has been completed and it's revealed something rather intriguing. A piece of information that could tell us more about the later use of this site. This feature here. Now this is the thing. This is this is interesting me now. Have you got the World War II trenches there? Yep. What is interesting here is they break with this regular crenellation, don't they? Yeah. When they hit this mound, I mean it, it, they've either come across well I would have thought stone or mm. or no something permanent yeah. that's caused them to go round it. That's like a raised platform that we can see there. I'm sure Mick will be interested in that. When the Lindisfarne Gospels were originally written, they'd have taken a skilled monk over five years to complete. It's astonishingly difficult, I was Jane. just going to yeah. ask you that. I it think I've really, got a scribe's really eye and is. scribe's finger, and I'm sure when I stand up, I'll scribe's back. <laughs> but you've oh. done amazingly well. It's, oh, thank you. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Could we have that for church, please? It'd be lovely, a real <laughs> reminder of our time here. Of course. Things are really starting to come together now. Jackie has almost completed the excavation of the bones in the South Doorway Trench, and over at the side of the chapel, work has finished on the skeleton Tracy uncovered. Three days ago, we set out to discover when the first structure was built on Ebb's Nook. It's finally time to give the Reverend Jane some answers. Great things have happened since think... yesterday, yes. But first, I want to tell you something about the site before the chapel was here. People were here before they even built the chapel. So how did you find that out? Well, you see, the, the evidence is in here. Can you see there? Yeah. There's a very oh. dark layer. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, that layer has got charcoal in it, and it's got evidence of where people were actually living. We've got it over in that hole over there. We've got it over here. And the foundations of the chapel cut through that dark layer. So that dark layer is earlier than the construction of the chapel. People were here. Who knows whether it's got anything to do with St Abbs? It may yeah. do. We just don't know how old that is. But the first building is this square ch chapel that we're now standing in. And, and it's a double square. And that type of plan is more associated with early buildings, say earlier than 1100. We've now dug this away, and you can see here, this is the foundation of the main okay. east wall that went right the way through. Yesterday, I was talking that maybe this would be where the altar originally yeah. stood. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think later on, you're actually going to be redepositing some bones that have been found eroding out yeah, the pathways what, that have been brought in by mm. local people. Might I suggest that this could not be a more appropriate yes. place? I mean, yes. this marks the place where the original altar would have been. Yeah, what yeah. better place to put yeah. them back? Yeah, that would be perfect. The very first building that stood on this site would have been a small chapel, possibly 7th or 8th century. We think this was extended in the 12th century to form a longer building. The mystery wall Matt found could have been part of a priest's dwelling. And the mound that Alex pointed out on the topography may have been the base for a large fire, a sort of primitive lighthouse. Our enigmatic conker trench remains a mystery. We chose not to disturb the baby skeletons any further and closed it down. We'll never know for sure, but it's possible that this area could have been the site of a very early standing cross. To help us date the site, we took radiocarbon samples from four of the chapel burials. Surprisingly, they all dated to between the 16th and 19th centuries. This means that Ebb's Nook was used as an unofficial cemetery for centuries after the chapel had gone out of use. The burials here were probably people excluded from the parish churchyard, perhaps those who couldn't afford a parish burial, or even bodies washed up on the beach. At the end of our three days here on Ebb's Nook, there's just one thing left to do. 
Over the past few years, the community have been picking up bones from the site. Now it's time to return them to where they belong. God our Father, in loving care your hand has created us, and as the potter fashions the clay, you formed us in your image. Through the Holy Spirit, you have breathed into us. However, the gift fascinating of life. the chapel itself in may be, it's this area of the site, the conquer, that I've been continually drawn to over the last three days. Although none of us could possibly have guessed the secret that would be revealed here. All these tiny little skeletons, babies whose mothers clearly wanted them to be buried in a church, but for some reason or other they couldn't. So instead, they placed them somewhere they believed to be holy. And in doing so, they carried on the age-old tradition that Ebb's Nook is a sacred place.